All right, let's begin. Uh, last reminder to download and install WMS. We're going to start using that real soon. So uh, please make sure that you're able to run it, like start the program after you install it, verify that it's loading OK. Uh, that way you'll be able to get some more good use out of the examples compared to just watching it. Um, homework 6 is due on Monday. And um, I think I sent out an email with an update to the last problem on that assignment. So if you didn't notice that, check your email. It's also posted on Blackboard. It's just that the uh, textbook manufacturer has moved some things around and the problem that I had intended is no longer there in the new edition of the book. So I just uh, wrote out the problem statement that I want you to solve on the PDF itself. Any announcement related questions before we begin? By the way, I guess I updated the, I did not update the title. Today we're going to be doing time of concentration, methods, and the rational method. All right. All right. So what we're talking about is some different formulas that are available to calculate the speed that water travels over the surface. And uh, Hortonian overland flow is when the rainfall intensity exceeds the ability of the soil to infiltrate water. And we've probably talked about this half a dozen times now, the notion that there is some maximum infiltration rate that water is able to bear early on in a storm, that it's declining as the soil suction head decreases. And at any time that the rainfall intensity is greater than the infiltration capacity, then there's going to be excess water at the surface that will flow over the surface. Um, so water is having to move around a series of obstacles, like think about blades of grass sticking up out of the ground. Or think about water flowing over the surface of an asphalt pavement, where the asphalt is made out of a mix of uh, sand and uh, binder material and small rocks. Um, water is moving over a surface with a very shallow depth. And uh, because of that shallow depth, the hydraulics are a little bit different than we would see in open channel flow. Although we still use some of the same techniques and equations to estimate the flow velocity, we'll sometimes have to use specialized guesses of the roughness. Because the flow is so shallow, we'll have different end values for overland flow than we would for flow through um, like a canal when the depth is several feet. There's different phases of flow. Uh, when water is first moving over the surface, it's flowing as a sheet. And then after 100 feet to 100 meters, so that is 100 feet to 330 feet, after some distance, depending on the intensity of the rainfall and the topography, then it may become shallow concentrated, where it's not yet a channel, but there's more flow at a single point than there is maybe at a, an adjacent point a foot away because some of the flow is grouped together. It's no longer just 100% e evenly distributed over the surface. So shallow concentrated flow occurs for a little while and then it begins to become channelized. And so this is, I guess you could say, shallow concentrated flow where you notice it. You know, it's a puddle that you jump over. Um, but to call it a channel is probably a stretch. You know, it, it's not an actual waterway that we've put into place or that lots of erosion has over the years caused an equilibrium with the soil scour. So it's not a channel, but concentrated. So there's a series of equations that I'm going to go through with you. And we're going to start with the most sophisticated and accurate method and then gradually work our way down the list to the most crude and, um, I guess, least informed equations. Because the most sophisticated of them, this kinematic wave approach, is taking a lot of factors into consideration in answering the question, how long does it take for the water to flow a certain distance? All of these formulas we are going to express in terms of a time. You could also have a kinematic wave equation that instead of telling you the time is telling you the velocity. But the two are directly related just based on whatever length is in question. So let's look at what factors are being accounted for 
in kinematic wave, where it's telling you how long it takes for the water to travel from one point to the other. So there's some distance L, and I guess maybe that's the first factor that it's taking into account is the travel distance. And the kinematic wave applies to distances up to about 100 meters, because beyond that, then the flow is no longer as a sheet. And when it's flowing in shallow concentrated uh, in a shallow concentrated way, then this, this equation has not been calibra calibrated for that. You'll notice this an empirical equation. It's not a fundamental equation that's derived from the first principles of physics. It's just a bunch of, uh, a bunch of variables we know have an impact on time of concentration with a series of curve fitting coefficients. So for example, we know that length is a factor. We know that the roughness of the material, so n is Manning's roughness coefficient for overland flow. So it could be that we're having to go to a completely separate type of table for these Manning's coefficients than we would for a typical flow through a channel Manning's coefficient. And we'll look at some n values in a moment. So think about this is the travel time, and it's depending on the roughness of the surface the length that it's traveling, the slope of the surface is a factor that's accounted for, and then also the rainfall intensity. And that may seem like an easy thing, rainfall intensity. You know, we can look up rainfall intensity off the precipitation data frequency server, but in this case, it's not a simple thing to know what the rainfall intensity is because of the dependency between rainfall intensity and time of concentration. Because the rainfall intensity that you should use is the rainfall intensity for a certain time of concentration. So we've had this whole problem before where we don't know the rainfall intensity until we know the time of concentration. We don't know the time of concentration until we know the rainfall intensity. So we start with a guess. So step one in this trial and error approach is just to start with a guess that, okay, maybe the travel time, you just kind of look at the situation, you say, 10 minutes maybe, 20 minutes, you make a guess, then you go to the table, the IDF table, intensity, duration, frequency, you look up what is the rainfall intensity for this guess value of the time of concentration, and then you'd use that intensity, find out what's the actual time of concentration, and then if the actual time of concentration is significantly different from your initial guess, then you'd find a new rainfall intensity, put it back into the kinematic wave equation, and go back and forth until the solution converges, until you're no longer having any changes in rainfall intensity, no further changes in time of concentration. So it's an iterative process, and because of that, this is the most accurate, because we're taking into account a lot of different factors, and in fact, the rainfall intensity is not some generic storm, it's the storm that is the critical defining storm for this particular stretch of overland flow that we're trying to model. So kinematic wave. Here is a value of roughness coefficients for n values. So you'll see there's concrete, sand, gravel, a variety of different uh, like agricultural type environments, so fallow, disked soil, soil that hasn't been tilled, and so on. And different types of grass, too. Anybody know what Bermuda grass is? That's the really thick stuff that they've got down in like South Carolina and Florida. I wish I could grow Bermuda grass. Oh, I guess they also grow it in Bermuda, probably. <laughs> but not, in, uh, not around here. Um, my grass just looks like a patch of rocks, basically. You know how on n value tables there's good condition, average condition, poor condition? There needs to be a very poor condition, and then that would describe what my lawn looks like. But in any case, you'll notice that uh, there's a typical n value and then a range of possibilities. And the reason why it's good to know the range is you want to do a sensitivity analysis sometimes. Um, because if, if you're doing a design, you don't want to just use this middle point value to find out how long it's going to take the water to travel from one place to the other. You may want to find out, you know, what's the worst case scenario if it goes very quickly. That's the worst case scenario when it comes to stormwater. So you'd want to 
put in both extremes of the end values in addition to maybe the midpoint typical end value. So calculate the lowest T sub C that you'd see, the longest T sub C, and the typical T sub C, and then look at the, uh, the runoff characteristics of all those different types of storms. And the reason why we care about the time of concentration is it's a very important factor when we use the rational method. And we'll talk about, I'll introduce the rational method today. Some people who are doing senior design projects that have a hydrology element have already started applying the time of, con uh, the, the rational method. So um, I'll clue everybody else in who hasn't started doing that yet. But how long it takes the water to travel over some surface is really important. So most accurate, but also most inconvenient because sometimes we don't know all that data, but most accurate. A little less accurate, NRCS. So what does it take into account? Well, the length, obviously, we, we wouldn't have a very good method if it's ignoring the distance to be traveled. So that's an obvious parameter. The N value is there again. So roughness is taken into account. Slope is taken into account. But instead of rainfall intensity, what it's asking us to put in instead is a precipitation depth. And so that's easier because it's non-iterative. We don't have to know the time of concentration to go look up the two-year, 24-hour storm depth in centimeters. You know, that's just a constant that we can look up off of the precipitation data frequency server. By the way, I'll point out that kinematic wave was intensity so inches per hour or millimeters per hour, in this case of 6.99 being the coefficient, intensity should be millimeters per hour. Here, it's not intensity, it's depth. So P2 is depth. So it's a little bit easier. Um, the NRCS also suggests, by the way, NRCS stands for the National Resource Conservation Service. It's an office of the Department of Agriculture that does a lot of hydrology work um, to um, support farmers and agriculture and the conservation of soil because um, topsoil erosion is a really big environmental and economic problem in the United States where during heavy rainstorms or when uh, farmers are tilling soil and it's loose and then there's a rainstorm, sediment can travel downstream and then you know, topsoil is being lost quicker than it's being regenerated. So the NRCS National Resource Conservation Service, one of the resources that they try to conserve is topsoil. And understanding the, the movement of water over the surface of the ground is one of the ways that you can um, try and prevent topsoil erosion. So this is all related to that mission that they serve. So this is just another method that also is limited to distances of about 100 meters, but they suggest a different method for sa shallow concentrated flow. <laughs> it's a pretty, uh, well, thanks a lot for that method. You know, they're just basically saying, how long is the shallow concentrated flow distance, and then what velocity is the water going? Oh, so I don't even know why they bother, but like it, it actually would be pretty easy to know what velocity if you're observing it. You just maybe throw a leaf down on the water and you would estimate the speed that it's traveling over a certain distance and then you could extrapolate that to other distances as well but shallow concentrated flow is something separate from the sheet flow time um, so this was a little bit less accurate because we're just using some standard precipitation depth that doesn't necessarily correspond to the critical intensity for, a, uh, for an area of interest. It's just kind of an overall precipitation depth. Kerpich equation is a little bit less accurate, a lot more easy to use because we're not even bothering to include an N value or any precipitation data. So we've really dumbed things down a lot in the Kerpich equation. Uh, there are correction factors that can be applied. Um, the Kerpich equation is uh, best when, you know, all these different formulas were 
empirical equations were um, generated with observations from different types of watersheds. So the Kerpich equation was for natural basins, so that doesn't mean like agricultural areas. Natural basins would be like raw land, bare earth overland flow, or flow in mode channel. So uh, less than 80 hectares in area, and a hectare is 100 meters by 100 meters. That's a hectare. And then these correction factors would say that, if, for example, if you happen to have overland flow over concrete, then you'd multiply it by 0.4 because the water is moving um, faster than it is over natural basins. Or if it's a concrete channel, the depth would be greater. And so the effect of resistance on a deep channel is less than for a shallow channel. So you'll notice that the multiplier is even smaller for a concrete channel, so that would reduce the time further. But then if you have, uh, if your channels are grassy, then you double the time because the water would move more slowly through a grassy channel than it would through like a bare earth channel. So only the length and the slope are going into this and then these correction factors. So we have to really take this data with a grain of salt. Um, you know, be conservative and if it's telling us some numbers that don't seem quite right, they probably aren't. And uh, to apply one of the other methods. Or really the best case scenario is that you're looking at a certain area with all of these different equations. And then if you have an idea of like what's all the bounds of predictions. You know, one method says 23 minutes, another method says 35, another method says 30, and then one of them says 5 minutes. Well, you'd throw out the outlier, and then you'd look at where the other aggregation of predictions are and maybe go with that. The Izzard equation, similarly uh, kind of limited in scale, where it is taking into account the rainfall intensity, but it, it wants to be the effective rainfall intensity. So the effective rainfall intensity is after abstractions. Um, there are k values here that take into account the slope and what's known as a retardance coefficient. So k is related to how quickly the water would be moving over the surface because when you have a really dense heavy grass, the retardance coefficient is greater than smooth surfaces like concrete or asphalt. So the K value takes both of those things into account, the rainfall intensity, the retardance coefficient, and also the slope of the surface itself. So this was derived from pavement and turf where overland flow is dominant. So this would be different from Kerpich, where it was natural basins. This would be big grassy fields for the Izzard. The Kirby equation allows us to go to a little bit longer of a distance, lengths of up to 365 meters, catchments less than 4 hectares, and slopes less than 1%. So, not real useful in natural watersheds here in West Virginia. It would only be in uh, developed areas normally that we'd have slopes as low as 1%. But it takes slope into account, some sort of a roughness factor, and then the travel distance. No rainfall intensity accounted for in the Kirby equation. So let's do that method that I suggested where we um, apply all of the different methods and see how they compare to each other. And, you know, since these are intended to be used in different types of areas, you couldn't actually apply all of them within the parameters that are specified. So, for example, we're going to do this for 1.5% slope, but we just saw for the Kirby equation that it's really intended for slopes less than 1%. So if we get an outlier from the Kirby equation, that would probably help to explain why. Is it's calibrated for slopes less than 1.1%, and our area that we're interested in here is 1.5%. But we're within the distance limit of all of the methods. We're going to look at a length of 75 meters, 
And then we are considering a, uh, a 20 minute storm. So that's the storm duration with an effective rainfall rate of 20, uh, 45 millimeters per hour. So in kinematic wave, what we'll do is um, we'll just go ahead and use the intensity of 45 millimeters per hour as our intensity. Um, but then what we'd know is if it predicts a time of concentration that is much different from 20 minutes, then we'd need to update with a different intensity. But as it turns out, the uh, time of concentration it predicts is pretty close to that 20 minute storm duration, so we'll be okay. So hopefully you've got the notes there in front of you. If not, I'll write the formulas on the board. I'm gonna pause the recording. I'd like you to go through and generate a set of calculations that you can have as a reference for when you do homework and other type stuff for all of these different methods. Let's go to the tables and get some data for a, uh, a grassy area. What is the N value that we're going to need to use for a grassy area? If we go to the N value table here, grass. So there's different types of grass. Um, we've got just grass, short prairie grass, dense grass, Bermuda grass. So the value that I had from the previous times I've worked for the example, I did 0.15 for the grass. And so I guess maybe what I must have been thinking was a short grass prairie but we'd have a different higher end value if it was more dense, like a good quality lawn. Here it's even mentioning some of the different species here. Weeping love grass, bluegrass. So that's what a lot of people around here have is bluegrass. Just for sake of uh, numerical consistency, let's assume that it's a uh, short grass prairie and use the 0.015, point, uh, 0.15 for the end value and the length here is 75 meters. for the uh, kinematic wave. So let me uh, bring that up on the screen before we move on to the NRCS method. Okay, let's zoom in here. Okay, so here's kinematic wave. Uh, we used a slope of 1.5%, so that goes in as 0 0.015. The intensity should be in millimeters per hour, and a 20 minute storm has this intensity of 45 millimeters per hour. We ended up seeing that our time of concentration is 23 minutes, and so um, that's about as close as you're gonna get when it comes to that iterative process of going back and getting different rainfall intensity data because our IDF table wouldn't have a column in it for 23 minutes. Uh, it would typically have 15 minutes, then 30 minutes, and so maybe we've extrapolated already to get the rainfall intensity for 20 minutes, but it's close enough that we don't have to go through that process of selecting a different rainfall intensity another time. So the calculations suggest it would take 23 minutes according to the kinematic wave method. Now in the NRCS method, things are a little bit tricky because the rainfall data that we have so far said that it was a 20 minute storm and that the intensity for that 20 minute storm was 45 millimeters per hour. And uh, that is a, an intensity of 1.77 inches per hour. So what we need to have for NRCS method is the depth for a 24-hour storm. 
So the way that we can get that is we can look at what is the typical ratio of the 20 minute duration to the 24 hour duration. And if we know that ratio, we could multiply it by the intensity that we have and extrapolate it that way. So we're going to be coming back to the precipitation data frequency server for another example as well. But let's go there now. Precipitation, well, so just to estimate, we don't know where this, the, the problem statement doesn't necessarily even say in this example where it is. Let's just assume it's somewhere here in West Virginia. And so we'll switch it to intensity from depth. And what I'm saying is let's find out what is the ratio of the 20 minute intensity to the 24 hour intensity. And we're going to have to extrapolate a bit because, um, you know, this has got 15 and then 30. So if 15 minute is 2.4 and the 30 is 1.6, then the intensity of a 20 minute storm is probably just in the vicinity of a uh, two. So two inches per hour at this particular location where the cursor is right now. And the 24 hour intensity is 0.093. 0.093 inches per hour. Okay, so if we multiply our depth, our intensity of 1.77 by this ratio, then what it'll do is it'll tell us what is the 24 hour intensity, and then we can find the depth by multiplying the intensity by the duration. So we were given 45 millimeters per hour, um, and when we put it into the NRCS method, we need to have the precipitation in terms of centimeters. And so that's 4.5 centimeters per hour multiplied by the ratio of 0.093 to 2 multiplied by 24 hours. And that's going to give us the depth for a 24 hour storm. It's just a way of extrapolating since we don't have, maybe I'll change this example and I'll make it an actual place because that wouldn't uh, require all of this guesswork. But 4.5 centimeters per hour, then multiply it by the ratio and multiply it by the duration of 24 hours. So that is a depth of 5.02 centimeters. in a 24 hour storm. Okay, so now into the NRCS equation. If we're using a depth of 5.02 centimeters, then we've got 0 0.0288 times the N value. We're still gonna go with this short grass of 0.15. The length, 75 meters. Here though, it's to the 0.8 power for the NRCS method divide by the precipitation depth in centimeters for a 24 hour storm. So 5.02 centimeters to the 0 0.5 power and then the slope to the 0.4 power. The slope is 0 0.015 to the power of 0 0.4. All right, so this will be interesting to see how different is the uh, time that it's suggesting. 0 0.02, if you'll please double check. I'll do the calculations, but I need lots of checks on this just to make sure. And this is going to give us the time in hours. So what I got was 0. 478 hours. Anybody else get similar? So if we multiply that by 60, that says 28.7 minutes. Pretty close. 23 minutes, 29 minutes. And that was with some really sloppy extrapolation between the 20 minute and the 24 hour. But it aligned.
Okay, now cure pitch is where things really fall apart because now, remember in cure pitch, we're not really in a smart way accounting for the surface. We're just saying we use this formula and then if it is concrete channels or asphalt, then we'll reduce the time. If it is flow in a grass channel, then we'll double it. So Kerpich equation is, uh, let me write, erase some of this other stuff. Okay, Kerpich equation 0 0.019 multiplied by the length is uh, 75 meters to the power of 0 0.77 and then divided by the slope, which is 0 0.015 the power of 0 0.385. Okay. I get from that 2.66 minutes. And then even if we double it because it is uh, flow over grass, then that's still only 5.32 minutes. So Kerpich isn't very good for this because it's mainly for natural basins. It's for larger watersheds than what we have in mind. Um, remember, it's for areas up to 80 hectares. And if what we're talking about is flow over some distance that's only 75 meters in length, then the watershed that's contributing to the flow is much less than the equation's been calibrated for. So to save some time for the uh, rational method, I think we'll just leave it at those three uh, sets of calculations um, just to show you what Izzard and Kirby look like. Um, with the Izzard method, what you do is you look up the retardance coefficient for the grass that it's describing in the slope characteristics. And uh, so Izzard, what came out of the Izzard uh, formula was 38 minutes as a guess. What came out of Kirby was 18.8 .8 minutes as a guess. And so kinematic wave was the most accurate, and it suggested 23. NRCS is slightly less accurate, suggested 29. Izzard and Kirby are on either side of those bounds. And then the Kirpich was the outlier that we just kind of ignore because it's so radically different from all the rest. But these are just different techniques to answer the question of how quickly does water move over the surface of the ground. And the reason why it's important is that oftentimes we'll have a watershed like this. This is an aerial photo of Huntington. And we'll want to know how much water is coming off of the watershed during a storm. So there are places in Huntington where they have separate storm sewers and separate sanitary sewers. But then a lot of Huntington has a combined sewer, which has both storm water and sewage going into the same pipe. So there's actually three different types. There's some that are storm only, some that are sanitary, which is a big misnomer, sanitary sewage. So some that are storm, some that are sanitary, and some that are combined. Um, and the reason why I bring it up is that there's been a move to try and separate those sewers where possible so that you're not sending tons of rainwater to the treatment plant because treating water is very expensive. There's a lot of electricity costs moving it and blowing air through it and uh, cleaning it up before you discharge it to the river. So if you can separate and put in a new storm only sewer, then you save a lot of money in the long term for a one time expense of putting the pipe in the ground. But the question is, how big should the pipe be? Um, what you need to do is consider the area in question. And let's say that we had a certain neighborhood where any of the water that falls in this area is going to drain to a central location. Um, you know, realistically, we'd have more than one catch basin. But maybe it's, you know, here's an alley. There could be a couple of different catch basins connected to a pipe in this alley. But then what we're trying to do is size the pipe that comes off of this stem. So there's a stem of catch basins that are connected. And then we want to drain this whole neighborhood. So there's some area in acres. 
And let's say that um, there's a certain rainfall intensity that we're able to look up off of the precipitation data frequency server and the critical intensity for us is related to the travel time. How long does it take for the water to travel from the furthest point of the watershed over to the outlet where everything is aggregating to? So we use the NRCS method or the kinematic wave method. We've used one of those methods to estimate the travel time from the furthest point to here. Because why the furthest point? We want to know the peak flow rate. That's what we're trying to predict, is how big should the pipe be based on accommodating all of the flow that will occur when it's raining. And the peak flow rate corresponds to the largest intensity when all of the areas are contributing. And the largest intensity is the one that corresponds to the time of concentration. And any duration longer than the time of concentration will be a lower intensity and therefore a lower peak flow rate. So the time of concentration is a really important factor. We've just spent some time calculating time of concentration so that we get the right intensity, I, to multiply by the area and some estimate of the runoff coefficient. So there's a factor, a C value, that basically tells you the percent of runoff that occurs. And there are tables that have been developed to predict the runoff for like grass versus roofs versus um, gravel and so on. Similar in idea to curve number, but with probably less precision because curve numbers take into account soil type and C values don't generally take into account soil type. So the way that you know Q is you just multiply the C value by the intensity and by the area and it'll give you the peak runoff in terms of cubic feet per second. Or if you're working in SI units, then you could have um, for the rainfall intensity meters per hour and then square meters for the area and you'd get cubic meters per hour as the flow rate. Um, this method always overestimates what the peak flow would be and so that's okay if it's conservative, if it's overestimating by 15 or 20 percent. Uh, it means our pipes are a little bit bigger than they need to be but then we've got some cushion in case we estimated the C values wrong. Um, it's best applied for relatively small watersheds. It's great for urban areas where we're able to characterize the C value with a little more accuracy. If it's a parking lot with a shopping center, then it's really easy to know what the C value is. But if it is a forest with crops, it's a little bit more ambiguous and subject to interpretation what the C value would be. Um, so it assumes a constant rainfall intensity um, and it assumes that it's the rainfall intensity that corresponds to the time of concentration. So what you do is first you calculate the T sub C, then you go to the IDF curve and get an intensity from that, calculate a weighted C value, and then solve for the flow rate. So here's a table of different C values and you'll notice that the C values increase for the larger return period storms. And I guess that makes sense that you know, like the part that isn't being run off is either being retained due to surface wetting. Like So think about concrete. So it's not like the water's penetrating down through the concrete. Like 75% runs off. What happens to the other 25%? It's just wetting the surface of the concrete. So what this is suggesting is in a two-year storm, 25% of the water is just lost to wetting the surface. But in a five-year storm where there's more water there, 80% of it's going to run off and only 20% will be tied up with surface wetting. So the larger the storm gets, the smaller the effect of the surface wetting and the greater the runoff. And the same factor occurs in all of these different surfaces, whether it is grass, undeveloped areas, and so on, that there is a, a factor that depends on the slope 
And so steep slopes have a higher runoff coefficient because there's going to be less infiltration compared to flat slopes. And then high, in uh, high intensity storms that have you know, a big return period, there's more runoff there as well. So just to get a feel for how this works, let me show you some calculations I did before class related to someplace here in Huntington. A five acre area, so that could be this very area that we've got on the picture here. Five acres and it's 30% roofs, 20% asphalt pavement, and 50% good grass on flat terrain. So we'd have to come up with a weighted C value and then use the rational method to estimate the, uh, the peak runoff during a 10 year storm. So what I did in these calculations was I calculated the weighted C value. So like if it's 30% roof area, I went to the table and said for a 10 year storm, the C value for roof area 0.83. For asphalt pavement, it's 0.81. For good grass, it's 0.37. And then I did an area weighted average, came up with a composite C value. Now um, I'm suggesting what if the travel time is 10 minutes from one edge of the watershed to the other? I haven't yet done the time of concentration calculations, but just to say for purposes of having a starting point, what would be the rainfall intensity with a 10 minute, um, 10 minute duration, 10 year uh, return period. So 4.65 is the rainfall intensity, inches per hour. I think this is just West Virginia in general. I had mine when I got the data on Huntington. So in the calculations that I did, I used a rainfall intensity 5.26 inches per hour for that 10 minute duration. And so the C value, you just get the cubic feet per second by multiplying the C value by the intensity in inches per hour by acres. And it's a coincidence that the uh, units work out to give you CFS because Acres multiplied by inches isn't necessarily cubic feet, but um, there actually is a 1.008 correction factor that you'd normally use. Here I showed you that like, if you converted the intensity to feet per hour and you converted the area from acres to square feet, then you know, if you're doing it with the base units the way they ought to be, it's 5.81. So most people just multiply inches by acres and it's pretty close. It's within less than 1% different. You'll get the cubic feet per second by multiplying inches per hour and acres. So we'll come back to this rational method several times through the semester, but I wanted to introduce it now because I think it helps explains why we care about time of concentration. All right, I've held you over. Download WMS and uh, homework six is due on Monday.